Hey, MSA community, I'm Jimmy O'Brien. I'm Marissa Eck. And I'm Aisha Lee. A little progress every day adds up to big results. So just think about anything that you do well, those skills that you do flawlessly, that thing you do effortlessly, correctly, and precisely, something that you would say you're pretty good at, what is it? Now think about when you first started it. Were you the same as you were now? P probably not. Think about the first time you began that skill. Were you as competent, confident, and graceful as you are now? Probably not. Most definitely not. Um, if you were to line up the day with now, you'd probably see two very different behaviors and you would have probably two very different perspectives on it. The question is, what has happened to you from that time until now? Now, we would all agree, well, practice. Some people have said practice makes perfect. Um, we say perfect, you know, or other people will say perfect. Practice makes perfect. But even that doesn't answer the question. We want to ask, what happens to you from a behavioral perspective? Now, given everything that we have talked about in these past newsletters, reinforcement, extinction, punishment, motivation, <clears throat> prompting, can a behavioral account address what it, means to, what it means about practice? How is it that you go from one behavior to another behavior with such skill and grace and style? So welcome to the Behavioral Beacon newsletter number nine, Shaping the Art and Science of Progressive Learning. So in this newsletter, we're going to define this process that we call shaping. We're going to discuss its essential elements. We're going to provide with you some common examples, and we're going to outline some general steps in the process. So before we even get started with shaping is, let me give you a personal story. When I was in Little League, I always wanted to play first base. It was, it was my dream. I wanted to be Chris Chambliss. I'm really dating myself. Chris Chambliss was a first baseman of the New York Yankees in the 70s. Yes, I'm telling you how old I am. And I always wanted to be first baseman. So when I was in my very first year, I was in what was called the farms. It so happened to be that my brother, John, was my coach. Now, I never had a really good arm. If anything, it was very weak. So I remember when I told my brother, I want to play first base, because you can't play first base. You don't have a, you know, a good arm for it. So what he made me actually do, which was kind of embarrassing, but when I look back upon it, I, I see where he was going. He made me go into the dugout, and he, and he made me stand about three or four feet from the gate in, in the dugout. And he put a big X, and he goes, I want you to throw the ball at this X till you can hit it. And I want you to do it 100 times. And I was like, what? I was so mad. Even at three feet, I couldn't even hit the X. I mean, it was that, it was that, it was that bad. And that's all I did during practices. I would just stand there and I'd throw the ball, stand there and I'd throw the ball. Every now and then he would come in, he'd look at me, he'd check on me. He's like, all right, I need you to move back, then move back. And this occurred over a few weeks up to the point where I had a very, very good arm. It was very laser focused, very detailed where I had probably one of the best arms on the team. Now, here's the rub. I was ready to play first base, but because I had such a strong arm, I was put in the outfield because I could tag anyone from the outfield to, to home. So what happened to me? What was that process? How was my behavior of throwing for, for, for um, speed and accuracy, how was that shaped? In other words, how did I go from, from this step where I'm hitting an X all the way to being out in the outfield, you know, hundred, you know, a few hundred feet away and being able to hit very precise things? Well, that's the process of shaping. And I still never forgave my brother for it. <laughs> what a great story. Okay, so now that we've kind of given you an example of what shaping is, um, let's talk about it more in depth. So what is shaping? And we have some visuals here that we hope you'll keep your eyes on as we're going through them. Um, here we have a, a little clump of clay that hasn't yet been molded or touched. And as we're gonna go on, you're gonna see it shape. So behaviorally shaping has been defined as the reinforcement of successive approximations to a target behavior, to produce a behavior that is currently not in a student's behavioral repertoire. Elsewhere, it has also been defined as 
the differential reinforcement of successive approximations of a target behavior until the person exhibits that target behavior. Differential reinforcement occurs when one particular behavior is reinforced and all other behaviors are not reinforced in a particular situation. So with Jimmy's example, he started being three feet away from the X and that's where his brother told him to start. That was the first step. And his brother was reinforcing being that close to the wall and throwing for speed and accuracy. But then after a few days, he was like, take you know three, three steps backwards. So then he was reinforcing the movement that far away, but if Jimmy took a few steps forward again, he wasn't being praised, let's say, for having moved forward because he's already ready to move back. He's right. ready. And, and in that in that example, <clears throat> for me, the reinforcement was hitting the target. Right. Any other throw that was outside of the target was not reinforced. Right. So as a result, consistently hitting the target was the reinforcer. In addition, right. also getting out of this practice trail. Right, yes. So without all those fancy and technical terms, shaping is a process of learning something from a starting point to an end point. It's baby steps or getting closer from where you start to the final end product, much like you would shape a piece of clay into an intricate vase. So here, that's why we use those visuals. You start with kind of a clump of nothing, and then you slowly start to shape it into, very slowly and successively shaping it into what we would call a vase. Um, and that doesn't happen overnight. That happens with a lot of practice, like we already mentioned. Right. So now we're gonna review some essential shaping elements. Right, well, before we do that, I've given you an example. <laughs> I've been brave <laughs> enough to give you an example of how something was shaped in my life. I mean, anything I do well has been shaped. Do you guys have any examples from your life that you do flawlessly and? Um, I can give an example of um, I wouldn't say I do it flawlessly, but it's a very good example of it in that I'm still in the process of phase two, but I think training for any type of race is an example of shaping. Um, if you do it correctly and you don't automatically wake up and say, I'm going to run a marathon tomorrow, which if you do, I don't know what you're thinking, but there takes, there's a lot of successive approximations that equal 26 point whatever miles to run a marathon. So um, from my experience, I haven't run a marathon. I don't know if I ever will, but I've run a half marathon and uh, I'm not a runner. So it takes time to plan, okay, the first few weeks, I'm going to run for 10 minutes. Week two, I'm going to run for 15 minutes. Week three, I'm going to run for 25 minutes. Um, that is a really important example of shaping in my life because without those broken down successive um, steps, I wouldn't keep practicing. I would give up because I when you're at the beginning of training for something and then you see the end goal, it's really scary. It's like staring at the top of a mountain and being like, nope, I'm never gonna make it to the top. So um, in my life, uh, training for a race is a really good example. Aisha, do you have an example of shaping? Um, I do have an example. Um, one example would be learning how to ballroom dance for the first time. Yes. Um, Hold on a second, wait a minute. Hold on. <laughs> this is the first time we've heard of this. <laughs> ballroom dancing. <laughs> yes, yeah, so in college. I'd love to hear I, this. In college, I took a ballroom dancing class. I was a little intimidated because I'm not used to ballroom dancing, but I thought it was interesting. So I just took to it. And um, it pretty much involved a lot of steps, and we had to practice. I had a partner who was a much better ballroom dancer than I was. So gradually learning each step until we got to the final product and it shaped into us finally being able to engage in a ballroom dance together. Oh. Wow, where'd you Very go? Cool. You oh. uh, Bro Brooklyn College, <laughs> just a regular <laughs> dance class. Wow, um, really quick, one year for Christmas, bon uh, my wife Bonnie got us dance lessons. That's I did one cool. dance lesson. <laughs> <laughs> that was it, okay. Yeah, those, those are some really good examples of shaping, mm -hmm. okay. So, do you want, so let's unpackage this kind of definition of uh, shaping. Yeah, so definitely. So here? yeah, when we're taking, when we're talking about unpacking that definition, we're going to talk about this visualization of steps, right? So like we said, shaping is a process of moving towards steps to a final product, skill, or repertoire. That could be throwing, that could be running, that could be dancing. It can be a lot of things. We're going to talk about some examples as we go on. But the essential elements look like this. You have a start point. So your initial steps, your starting behavior. That might be um, learning how to hold yourself in a ballroom dance stance, not even moving your feet, just 
standing with another person knowing where to put your hands. For me, for it would me, just be it would just be saying ballroom dancing. Yeah. <laughs> that would be just my thing. Just even going to the building where the class is. <laughs> step one for Jimmy. <laughs> um, for me with running um, a 5K, 10K, half marathon, the initial step is deciding what shoes I'm going to use usually, um, picking out a new pair of shoes or picking out a training app that I want to use, Nike or t Couch to 10K, whatever it is. Um, for Jimmy, the first step for um, throwing was, was what? Being told just that be, you know, Just being able to pick up the ball and, and pro project it a few okay. feet. Now, whether it was accurate or not, it wasn't accurate or not, but the ability of just being able to pick up the ball and engage in this behavior. Yep. So those are examples of what the initial step starting behavior is. And then as we move towards the terminal goal, which is to be able to throw it from the outfield, be able to do a full ballroom dance, be able to run a half marathon, there's, you have to break it into those um, differential, re you're, you're using differential reinforcement to reinforce moving towards the terminal goal. So that means you're breaking it down to those attainable goals, but you're not taking any steps backwards. So you're always gonna be moving forward and reinforcing steps towards the future goal. Um, and that's what we call the successive approximations. They look like they're going, when we say successive approximations, it's just like little baby steps towards that eventual goal. So it looks like it might not be much, but when you break it down into those really tiny attainable skills, it equals a much bigger skill. Yeah, it's that movement towards, the movement towards. What is it? What you know, what's happening environmentally that gets us to that target response. And like we had mentioned before, from a reactive perspective or consequential thing is that it's the feedback we get. As we get closer and closer to whatever that target is, we get reinforced. As we move further away, either there's no reinforcement or at times there might be some form of punishment. So it's these kind of movements toward, it's the reinforcement um, and the, the reinforcement of closer and the extinction or punishment of lesser that gets us to where we need to go. And sometimes you might start somewhere and end up at a completely different thing without even realizing it. And that's what we were trying to you know, say is that anything that you do good in life is based upon this process. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last, the last part of shaping the, is the target goal or the terminal behavior. That's why we have, we're using the finish line as um, our visual there because that's just the last step, that's where you are. That's doing the behavior without having to break it up. It's just naturally, it naturally occurring because of all the steps that led up to it. So it's throwing a ball from the outfield or throwing the ball from first base. It's being able to do a ballroom dance. It's being able to run a race, just to our examples. But we're gonna go through some others as we go along. All right, so let's kind of unpackage it even further, okay? Mm -hmm. You want me to do this one or you wanna do this one or? You got it. Oh, okay. <clears throat> so. Um, like we've kind of mentioned, you need some starting behavior. Like this is the, where do you begin? This is the lump of clay. This is the, the very first start process. So you have to start somewhere and with something. You need a behavior uh, to begin with. More specifically, you need a behavior that a person already engages in or that has some resemblance or relevance to the behavior that you're um, go going to be targeting. And that kind of makes sense, right? You have to roll over before you crawl. You have to crawl before you walk. Although some people are like, well, I, I went from crawling to running. You get the idea. You have to walk before you run, right? So think about your repertoires. Think about the skill that you do now and try to think about where it started. Like we had mentioned earlier, for me, it could have, even if I couldn't have thrown the ball, my brother was trying to shape me to throw the ball, it could have been just <clears throat> walking to the ball. It could have been looking at the ball. Well, where, you know, <clears throat> At the time of this um, taping, we are in um, a pandemic, right? And one of the big things that you know um, is recommended is wearing masks. And some of our learners right now might have very might have difficulty even putting on a mask. Some some of our learners can put on a mask. So we're going to use this process also to help some of our learners with this kind of mask wearing behavior, right? So let's say, for example, a learner can wear a mask. What we might do, what would be the, the terminal or end behavior might be long durations. And we're going to use this process for, for, for that type of behavior. Let's say we have a, a young learner who doesn't want to wear a mask. What might be the first uh, initial step there? And for some of you who we've, we've kind of worked with, it just might be having the mask on the table. 
right? You have the mask on the table, just having the mask on the table. For some of it, it might be putting the mask here. For some of it, it might be holding it in their hand. That will begin the first part of this long, um, I don't want to say long, but this kind of long, yeah, I guess it's a long process in the sense of how many steps are, are actually necessary. For some learners, it can go fast. For other learners, it could take a little bit longer. But again, we have some starting point. I think I'm, I think I'm okay with that. You guys have anything to add to that? No, that sounds great to me. All right, so now we're going to talk about um, successive approximations and differential reinforcement. So the steps and feedback. So these two elements are going to go hand in hand. Successive approximations are the steps that get you closer to your target behavior slash goal. And differential reinforcement is a mechanism or what happens of how you get there. So successive approximations are those behaviors or steps that move closer from where the behavior started to where the behavior is going and should be. Like we mentioned above, turning over and running look very different, but turning over leads to crawling, which leads to furniture walking, which leads to independent walking, which leads to running. But do you go from one step to the next seamlessly? Definitely not. There is a lot of feedback from the environment that helps with that. And just what is that feedback? Well, it's a combination of those consequential events that occurs after we engage in a behavior. That is reinforcement moves us closer to the target steps and extinction or punishment decreases the steps that do not. As you get closer, approximations are reinforced while all other previous steps or things you didn't you did do not, don't get reinforced or might get punished. And over time, this process will move you closer and closer to the end result, which is what we call the terminal behavior. That was a lot of words there for everyone. Um, but really, I think we, what the important thing is, is that knowing that every skill that we have starting from when we learn how to crawl, you don't go from crawling to running, knowing that there are these steps in between that get you from being able to crawl to then being able to run and move independently. So just keeping that in mind is that all the things that we do so seamlessly um, does include shaping naturally. Cool. Anyone I want to add? No? Okay. Nope. <laughs> I really want to keep talking about my brother and throwing the book, but I think it's going to be more so of a counseling session at this point. <laughs> 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 I keep thinking about it. I'm like, I'm back there again. And I'm just, anyway. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so, after all that kind of successive approximations, you finally end up to that beautiful vase, that end point, right? You start with clay and you're, you're modeling, uh, not modeling, you're molding it and you're shaping it till it becomes a clay. So when we say terminal or target behavior, what we're referring to is the final behavior or the response that is the result of these successive approximations or this baby step, or as we move closer and closer and closer. How do we move? We move them <clears throat> through reinforcement of closer approximations of closer steps and non-reinforcement or punishment for those that are not closer. <clears throat> and as a result, we get more to a target behavior. So this is where you end up in your final step in a shaping procedure. So for example, the final step in learning how to ride a bike is riding the bike, right? All of the previous steps, sitting on it, balancing yourself, riding a little bit with training wheels, riding a little bit with one training wheel, riding it <clears throat> maybe on the sidewalk, riding in the street, that all gets eventually shaped. The thing about bike riding is, what do you think the reinforcement is? If it's not external, right? What do you think the reinforcement is of riding a bike? What do you guys think? I think being able to get from point A to point B is reinforcing. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Also, what happens when you fall? It hurts. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there's a there's that kind of natural contingency. There's that there, kind of yeah. there's that kind of punishment. Like like we'd mentioned earlier in other previous newsletters, is that punishment doesn't mean what it's supposed to mean in the vernacular, but it means a consequence that either you get something you don't like or something you like gets taken away. So anytime I did not engage in the correct <clears throat> movement, I fell over. And as a result, all those types of behaviors were met with something that I didn't like. And as a result, those ones that were avoided it. And now I'm doing it flawlessly. That's kind of the example. That's the kind of things we want you to think about, not only for the skills that you engage in, the skills that your learner engages in, and more, and even more importantly, the skills that we ultimately would want our learners to engage in so that they're more independent and they're not relying on us. Okay. 
I think I said enough for that. So let's kind of spend a few moments and go through some common everyday examples of shaping. Now, this isn't an exhaustive list, but these were the few things that kind of come to our mind. So like we mentioned earlier, anything that you do and do well has been the result of this shaping process, of this starting from here and this kind of dynamic movement of getting feedback, moving closer and closer to these end results. So one of them, like we have already mentioned, is crawling, walking, running, right? Where you started looks completely different from where you ended up. Like, right. how do you go, how, how did you get to being able to run 26 point something something mild marathons? Yeah. Right. And we think it's this kind of process. Yeah. Um, another example that I wanted to put on here that I forgot, but I think it's important because Jimmy just found out this fact about me is I did not know how to swim for a very long time. <laughs> and shaping was really big part of that because I had a lot of fear of water because of a really ridiculous incident that happened when I was a child where I was dropped in a dolphin tank at Disney World. And you guys, you know the story. My mom's like tore her ACL while she was like holding me on her shoulders over the tank at SeaWorld and fell and I fell into the tank. Oh my gosh. And then we got to go to Disney for free for a, a while, but it was very traumatic for me because I was Good about enough. three and that's like right when you start to realize your fears. <laughs> Um, so it took me a really long time to be comfortable in water without someone with me. And uh, my partner lives in Florida. We are in Florida right now and there is a pool. And he was like, you gotta learn how to swim. So the first day was just sitting in the water with, with me hugging him like a little koala. <laughs> and then day two was, you know, me letting go for a few seconds and then being in the, the shallow end. And then now I'm able to swim, you know, from the shallow end to the deep end and go underwater and all that it still makes me a little nervous, but um, cause I'm not ready for the ocean, but I'm very good in a pool, but that's a really good example of shaping in my everyday life. <laughs> I still need work with swimming. I don't know how to swim <laughs> yet. So I might need a shaping over procedure Asia. myself. <laughs> but another example that we don't have listed that I can think of is going from using four wheel uh, roller skates to rollerblading. Um, it's very different. The first time I tried it, I failed a couple of times, but I had to keep practicing. And the more and more that I practiced, the better I got it. So that's one example. That's a great example. Um, let me just add two more, right, that are not on this list. And we don't have to go ex exhaustively to the list, but let's talk about, um, I completely forgot what I was just going to say. Um, <laughs> yes. Okay. What about the treatment of phobias, right? What is it that one does when they're being treated for a phobia, right? It's <clears throat> small successive approximations to a target response. So if you think, right? So think about it for some of some guys who have phobias, what do we typically do? We might have the thing, that person, place, or thing that they're afraid of, and they might be so far away from it, right? And that might be the entry. For some individuals, it might be, hey, can we just talk? Like if you had a fear of cats, and I can't put a cat in the room with you. It just might be, let's just talk about cats. Let's look at pictures of cats. And as you get more and more comfortable, we then start to bring in that thing which you're actually afraid of. So eventually, you're not as afraid. I mean, that's a whole shaping process. But here's another one. Here's one that we, we haven't talked about. What about challenging behavior, right? How do you think some of the topographies or behaviors that some of our individuals or even ourselves have engaged in? Right? So if you think about it, <clears throat> most of the time for, some, for a challenging behavior, it might start off not as bad. It might be some type of whining or some type of um, refusal. And what usually happens is we kind of figure out what the function is. We try to teach some functional communication, but there are times where we try to work through the challenging behavior and not provide the reinforcement for the challenging behavior. But what we know now about extinction or not giving in or <clears throat> providing the reinforcer is that sometimes that behavior has a tendency to increase in frequency, in intensity, in duration. At other times, you might see novel behavior. So could you just imagine, you're in a supermarket, your child wants something, you say, no, you can't have it. They whine a little bit, you're like, ah, I can't deal with this. Yeah, just have it. So now the next time you go, the child is whining and crying, you're a little bit more with it, and you're saying, no, you can't have it. The screaming gets a little bit louder. The screaming gets a little bit more intense. You're like, you know what? They're still not getting it. But now they start flailing their hands. Like, hey, what are you doing? Don't do that. You know, we're outside. You feel uncomfortable. And now you give the candy. 
Now, where did that go from? It went from whining and not to flailing their hands. The next time you go, you're just like, all right, this time I'm not going to give into it. I'm going to be steadfast. I'm just going to keep going. I'm going to distract them. I'm going to do all these things. I'm going to reinforce, you know, uh, quiet behavior. I'm going to reinforce attending and attending to the task. Now they get to the candy aisle. They start flailing their hands like, nope, nope, I'm going to do it. And now what happens is as they're flailing their hands, they hit themselves on the head accidentally. I'm like, hey, are you okay? And now what happens? Now the next time it doesn't go from whining. It doesn't go from flailing. It has the potential now to go to some self-injurious behavior. Now I'm, I'm, I'm making this very quickly, but you can sometimes see that sometimes even challenging behaviors whether it's self-injury or aggression or any other type, can be slowly shaped through the course of, of, of one's history. So I just wanted to put that out there. Um, I think that was it. I think so too. Yeah, all right. <clears throat> so let's kind of finish up with some just general, so you know, if you are cognizant of this now, because I think most of, most of this stuff for us will just happen unwittingly without us knowing about it. This is, you know, we talked about how the environment will give us feedback and moves us into these directions. But now that you know about this process <clears throat> and you can be conscious of it, how might you be able to use these steps to help our learners for greater independence or even yourself? So here's some of the general steps if you guys want to take it over. How to do currently is I would really love to master the art of making like a really good sourdough bread. I know everyone and their mom is talking about this right now because of quarantine, but I would really love that. I would love to learn how to make bread, but there's a lot of steps that you have to do to that. So that would be a select, I would select a target behavior and I would define what that looks like. Aisha, can you describe number two? Sure, we're gonna select the initial starting behavior. So basically, what is your starting point? What behavior will you engage in, <clears throat> sorry, to start your, shape, your shaping procedure? Um, number three, you're then going to select powerful reinforcers. What will you use to reinforce when it occurs? So when we're talking specifically about um, our students, it's really important to select something that is super, super powerful and motivating for them to give them, to first create that contingency of like, oh, when I engage in this behavior, good things happen to me um, so that we can use that reinforcer as we move forward to steps four through seven. Next, you're going to determine successive approximation slash steps, and that is what small steps are you going to engage in that's going to get you to your terminal behavior. Perfect. And number five, you're going to reinforce those steps. You're going to reinforce the successive approximations to the target behavior. So you're going to start um, with just reinforcing something. Even we're using the mask example. Let's you know, imagine we're talking about a student who just won't wear the mask at all, we would start really small, but it, it's a starting point. So we would start with just tolerating the mask on a table in front of them or tolerating the mask on another person. And we would reinforce that either pre presenting a preferred item, an edible, a video, whatever it is. Um, and then we would move on. Next, you're going to reinforce target behavior continuously and then intermittently. And what that means is you're going to reinforce after each successive step is completed and then once those skills are targeted once those skills are targeted then you can reinforce intimately and that means you can pull back on some of your reinforcement yep perfect um, and then step seven is ensure generalization what we mean by that is can it happen across locations with different people with different materials so for the mask example if they've mastered wearing it in their house around their parents Will they tolerate wearing it to CVS? Will they tolerate wearing it at school? <laughs> we will see. Um, so that's an example of what we mean by going through those general shaping steps. And eventually the eventual goal is that it happens naturally across environments, across people and across materials. Right. That's a nice way of kind of putting them all together. And that's what we basically meant by shaping that it's this art and it's a science of progressive learning. So what is the scientific part? It's <clears throat> developing the steps, using reinforcement and extinction and, and punishment to kind of move them through those things. What's the art part? And I think really the art part is really when to provide reinforcement and when not to. So it's kind of like, you know, like I, it's, it's like a ballroom dance. You have to kind of know your individual. You have to know when to stay the course. You have to know when to say, okay, this is no longer going to meet with reinforcement. But what I need now is a, a, a closer approximation. So it is both artful and scientific in that approach. And that's what we meant by that. It's this dynamic kind of interplay between you and the, and the other person. All right. So let's kind of finish this up and put this baby to bed.
All right, so here's some tips of the week. Review the general steps of shaping. Think about some of the things we would want our learners to know how to do. Think about where they currently are with that skill. Move them closer to where they would need to be. And lastly, remember to give them time. Little by little becomes a lot. Right, so it's, it's like give time time. And the reason why we say give time time is give that, dyna that dynamic interplay back and forth, right? That's the art part. Move, be scientific, but also be artful too. Mm -hmm. All right, so we hope you kind of enjoyed that. We hope you got something out of it. We hope you um, know a little bit more about us and don't judge us for some of our stuff. <laughs> um, and as always, I'm Jimmy O'Brien. I am Marissa Eck. And I'm Aisha Lee. Be well Thank and take care. Be well. Bye, guys.